Dear friends, welcome to e-part shala. I am Dr. Vishal Jadav, Department of Sociology, Tilak Maharashtra Vidyapeet. Today we are looking at a module titled Class, Passive Revolution and Indian Democracy, which is part of the political sociology paper. Several Marxist scholars such as Sudipta Kaviraj, um, Bal Gopal, Pranab Bardhan and Partha Chatterjee have argued that a proper revolution could never take place, that is the working class revolution could never take place in the Indian context because the Indian national movement was led by a quasi bourgeoisie leadership which was urban based intellectuals and therefore the laboring class and the subaltern groups remained at the margins even in the post independent period. This module will try and understand how this happened and what were the reasons and what were the circumstances under which this could take place. Rejecting orthodox views of transition to capitalist democracy in India. The failure to enact a bourgeoisie revolution in post-independent India generated some major debates and revisions within Marxist schools in India. Firstly, many scholars like Pranab Bardhan, Sudipta Kaviraj and Partha Chatterjee began to argue that we need to modify the classical bourgeoisie revolution paradigm if we want to understand how the transformation towards capitalist democracy is occurring in India. In the dominant mainstream view, it was held that the development of capitalist relations in society leads to capital gaining hegemony which would eventually destroy feudal relations and establish parliamentary democracy. These scholars argued that instead of a bourgeoisie revolution, what we are witnessing currently was a passive revolution. They looked to Gramsci to understand the complexities of transition of Indian society. The term passive revolution was popularized by Antonio Gramsci as a situation where one in which the new claimants to power lacking the social strength to launch a full scale assault on the old dominant class opt for a path in which the demands of a new society are satisfied by small doses legally in a reformist manner in such a way that the political and economic positions of the old feudal classes are not destroyed. Agrarian reform is avoided and most important the popular masses are prevented from going through political experience of a fundamental social transformation. Gramsci imbibed the term with at least two distinguishable and relatively separate meanings. The first indicated a revolution that was directed from above by elites occurred without the active participation of the masses. His second conceptual framework described a passive revolution as a long historical process involving a set of gradual molecular change in society. Gramsci treated passive revolution as a blocked dialectic, an exception to the paradigmatic form of bourgeois revolution which he takes to be that of Jacobism. In his term, a passive revolution represented the apparently contradictory concept of a revolution without a revolution. Passive revolution thus seeks to conceptualize processes through which systematic transformations are achieved by non-revolutionary means. It describes the means by which a dominant group maintains hegemony by incorporating forces which potentially threaten its dominance. The state is modernized without undergoing a political revolution or having passed through a revolution without revolution. Those who are disempowered remain so. Contrary to what happens in the real or active revolution, however, in passive revolution no fundamental restructuring of social relations take place. Hence the term passive revolution refers to a political process that is reformist in nature. Such a process according to Gramsci can either be steered by a liberal party or by a fascist political force. Applying the Gramscian framework, many scholars pointed out that the basis of blocked dialectic lies in the inability of the Indian nationalist movement to create a bourgeoisie revolution in India. That 
the rise of the anti-colonial nationalism resulted in the nationalist bourgeoisie establishing hegemony and speaking on behalf of all the nation citizens. But it did not result in profound social and political change. Sudipta Kaviraj argues that le leading elites created a passive revolution because of the refusal to mobilize the Indian population for a radical program of reform. He notes how, in principle, feudal and conservative resistance could have been overcome if the Indian National Congress or the INC had been willing to encourage popular action by using the levels of mass mobilization already achieved in 1945-47 for the radical purposes in their stated aims. For a thoroughgoing bourgeoisie revolution to be effected, for industrialization to take place, a domestic market must be built up by reducing poverty in the countryside. This can only be done by effective land reforms, which have been legislated but never effectively implemented because of the influence of landed interest in the coalition of the ruling classes. Beyond removing the larger parasitic landlords, land reforms were carried out indifferently and though the size of the property class expanded, land ownership remained largely confined to the local dominant caste. The program of serious bourgeoisie land reforms was abandoned through a combination of feudal resistance, judicial conservatism and connivance of state congress leadership. The entire planning process until the 1980s had been an exercise in trying to promote industrialization without the radical transformation of agriculture. Efforts to develop and democratize local institutions for community development and democratization such as village councils and cooperatives were also defeated by elite capture. In sum, the state enmeshed itself in a matrix of accommodations and patronage networks and thus undermined its ability to pursue transformative projects, including the extension of public legality to rural areas. While this mode of engagement of society did provide a basic framework for political order, it failed to build institutionally robust arenas of civic associationalism and severely curtailed both the instrumental and the authoritative efficacy of the state. To borrow a phrase from Gramsci, the state come Congress could rule, but it could not lead. Secondly, there was a rejection of traditional Marxist frame work of state studies because it was felt that they tended to reduce politics to societal variables. In general, both earlier liberal and orthodox Marxist theories focused on social determinants of political process like level of economic development and detracting attention from the state, a significant agent in shaping and molding political and social processes. Early Marxist narratives seriously underestimated the significance of the political functions of the state and continued to view the state as merely an expression of class relations rather than a terrain, sometimes an independent actor in the power process. Most Indian scholars were dissatisfied with the structuralist and economist accounts of Indian politics. They wanted to emphasize the constitutive role of the political. It was felt that the persistence of instability since the 1970s could only be explained as a larger problem of political crisis. Sudipta Kaviraj argued that while structuralist analysis was important, this was not enough and what we needed to look closely at this actual actors and tactics by which reproduction of hegemony of capital is occurring in India. Kaviraj argued that the transition story would also have to be constructed in terms of actual political lead actors suspending the question of more fundamental causalities for the time being that it must be also told in terms of governments, parties, tactics, leaders, political movements and similar contingent but irreplaceable elements of political narrative. The capitalist domination over the society is achieved through the practice of governance, which according to Kaviraj refers to a process of actual policy decisions within the apparatuses of the state. Such a control is achieved through a coalitional strategy carried out partly through the state directed process of economic growth partly through the allocational necessities indicated by the bourgeois democratic political system. Finally, it was felt that there was a need to reject the Eurocentrism of both orthodox Marxism and liberalism and instead 
embrace the unique trajectory of modernity in post colonial societies. Kaviraj formulated modernity as a set of processes that can follow different sequences and different societies and at different historical conjunctures. The unique trajectory could not but affect the character of both democracy and capitalism in different societies. Kaviraj argued that this difference in sequence of modernity was all important to understand the transformation of Indian society and the political crisis afflicting the state. He argued that while in the West the processes of modernity stabilized themselves before the pressure for democracy began, in India it played out differently. Capitalization emerged first and then democracy arrived in Europe which was able to cohere around that. But if democracy had predated, it may have hindered or even stopped capitalism. Precisely because Western modernity followed the sequence it did, it could produce both a disciplined labor force steeped in a new productive skilled uh, capitalist work ethic as well as a body of autonomous self-determining individuals so crucial to the production of the citizen before the onset of democracy. The fact that both democracy and a liberal discourse of the rights appear in the post-colony period to capitalist industrialization and individuation but alongside the, an emergent anti-colonial nationalism has far-reaching consequences for both the nature of its democracy and its capitalist development. Capitalism in its peripheries is confronted by the democracy and the avenues of protest and struggle that it has made available. It no longer has the means available to discipline or normalize the working class in the new work ethic though through brutal laws on vagrancy and vagabondage as it did in say England. It has had to face an organized working class movement almost from the very early stages of capitalist development in India for instance. As such we have the existence of trade unions and a labor movement from the very early years of capitalism in India. The capacity of the Indian capitalism to produce a disciplined working class was therefore extremely limited from the start. Equally important is that it had to face growing opposition from ecological movements that make the wholesale uprooting of agricultural populations far more difficult than was possible in say 17th and 18th century Europe. As the instances of recent struggle show, its capacity to ruthlessly tear apart from the traditional agricultural communities from the land and throw them into an urban labor market are likewise very limited. Despite two centuries of colonial rule and over a century of laws like Land Acquisition Act 1894, India at the beginning of the 21st century remains largely an agri agricultural country. Characteristic features of Indian passive revolution. The critical Marxist scholars argued that the transition to capitalist democracy in India shows two important unique characters. Firstly, they argued that since capital is not hegemonic in society, power is exercised in the form of a coalition consisting of three elements, monopoly bourgeoisie, landed elite and the bureaucratic managerial elite. Thus, the Indian capitalist class exercises its control over society neither through a moral cultural hegemony of the Grangeman type nor a simple coercive strategy on the lines of satellite states of the third world. The nature of class power in Indian society is such that capital is not independently dominant in Indian society and state. Power had to be shared between the dominant classes because no one class had the ability to exercise hegemony on its own. Kaviraj also argued that the nature of the true coalition and not just its composition was also different from traditional Marxist accounts of the ruling coalition. The latter were inadequate because they saw the bureaucratic elite as being too straightforwardly subordinated to the power of the bourgeoisie and saw what was basically a coalitional and bargaining relation as a purely instrumental one. The key point was that the coalition was not in effect or an accidental attribute of dominance which is otherwise adequate. It is its condition. Thus, the contradictions between the interests of the fractions of the ruling classes are 
as crucial in determining state policy as are the contradictions between the ruling class and the ruled. Some scholars like Kaviraj also argued that despite its weakness, capital exercised the directive function in the coalition. By its nature, it is only truly universalizing element in the ruling bloc. Among the ruling groups, the bourgeoisie alone can develop a coherent, internally flexible development doctrine. Pre-capitalist elements have not had an alternate, have not had an alternative coherent program to offer. Their efforts have been restricted mainly to slowing down capitalist transition and ensuring comfortable survival plans for their own class. The bourgeoisie does exercise a leadership function in this coalition because the non-capitalist sectors and types of production and economy have been subsumed economically and politically under the logic of capital. Several scholars like Ashutosh Varshney, Achin Vanayak and Rudolf and Rudolf however emphasize the growing political clout of the rich farmers or agrarian capitalists within the dominant coalition. The coalition was based on an explicit or implicit protocol, a network of policies, rights, immunities derived from both constitutional and ordinary law which sets out over a long period the terms of this coalition and its manners of distribution of advantages. The sharing of power was a process of ceaseless push and pull with one class gaining a relatively ascendancy at one point only to lose it at another. If any of these classes is seriously dissatisfied and leaves the ruling bloc that not only alters the structure of the coalition but threatens it with political disaster. Kaviraj argued that the choice of any political moves have real effects on the internal politics of the ruling bloc. If a common objective say an industrial policy can be achieved by three differently worked out policy the options X, Y, Z, the preference for these options would be often differently ranked by different components of the ruling bloc. These would result in different states of distribution of long term and short term benefits and among these benefits very often figures the purely political strategic advantage of having a favorable format of procedure of decision. Economic plans led to some serious shifts in the internal power distribution of the society, though primarily within the elements of the ruling bloc itself. Thus, for example, insistent requirements of capitalist development under Nehru's regime threatened to infringe that agreement within the protocol of coalition. Nehru's policy initiatives in the late 50s and early 60s led to a double process of polarization in politics. Government initiatives in three interrelated areas, creation of heavy industries in the public sector, increasing reliance on Soviet assistance in their construction and the pressure from the planning element in government for changes in agrarian sector towards cooperativization led to sharp criticism of the Congress. These Nehruvian policies came under strong fire from a panicking combine of representatives of propriety classes. Congress industrial policies were interpreted as the thin end of the socialist stick. Land reforms proposals shamefully mild and solidly bourgeoisie appeared to the other classes as of coalition as a program of an agrarian revolution from above. The public sector intended merely to displace the center of control towards the state was seen as an attack on private enterprise. Grievance against industrial policy and related issues led to the formation of Swatantra party. But more significant changes happened in the rural political scene. There was a large scale exodus of farmer support from the Congress and formation of regional farmers groupings. The second important feature of passive revolution in India was the relative autonomy of the state as a whole from the bourgeois and the landed elite. It is important to see the managerial bureaucratic elites as major participants in the structure and dynamics of political dominance. They do not merely participate in enjoying the fruits of political dominance, but at significant decisional moments play a major strategic and directive role among the dominant classes. Although not bourgeoisie in a direct productive sense, culturally and ideologically it was strongly affiliated to the bourgeoisie order. This class was even 
Before independence, as some historical works show, the repository of bourgeoisie's political intelligence, working out a theory of development for Indian capitalism, often correcting more intensely selfish objectives of the monopoly elements by giving them a more reformist and universal form. It is not only true that they mediate between the ruling coalition and the other classes, but they mediate crucially between the classes within the ruling coalition themselves. They also provide the theory and the institutional drive for bourgeois rule. Kabiraj argued that the relative autonomy of the Indian state from the ruling classes occurred for two reasons. One, as with other post-colonial societies, the Indian state at independence inherited a vast and well-developed state apparatus, that is the civil and military bureaucracy, which had served the colonial purpose. Thus, the state had the potential to be more than merely an instrument of the ruling class, a potential further enhanced by the fact that colonial practice policies had resulted in a comparatively weak and unstable bourgeoisie, which is capable of controlling the state apparatus on its own. Another was that since the bourgeoisie is weak and capital resources low, the state was the only agency at independence that could draw together scarce capital resources and invest these base in these in basic infrastructural areas, which need large initial investment and yield slow profit. Kaviraj argued that capital on its own cannot expand through market transactions and therefore dependent on the legitimized directive mechanisms of the state. For in the growth of the late capitalism like the Indian one, the Indian social form of capitalism itself realizes that the state is a historical precondition for much of its economic endeavors and for its political security. The state thus ensured the domination of the bourgeois and helped in capitalist reproduction and to subordinate reproduction of other types of economic relations by imposing on the economy a deliberate order of capitalist planning. Those directive functions that capital cannot perform through the market either because the market is imperfect or not powerful enough because such tasks cannot be performed by market pressures. The bourgeoisie forms through the legitimized directive mechanisms of the state. Thus, the ruling elite adopted a plan for heavy industrialization and institutional control of capital goods industries through the sex state sector, a largely untried experiment at the time in the underdeveloped countries. The government policy was aimed at encouraging import substitution, industrialization, quantitative trade restrictions, providing automatically protected domestic markets and off running a large public sector providing capital goods intermediate products and artificially low prices. Since the mid 50s, the government also created several public lending institutions, loans from which form the predominant source of private industrial finance. The crisis of the passive revolution process in the 1980s. Increasingly in the 1980s, many critical Marxist scholars felt that the passive revolution in India was in a crisis and beset with deeper contradictions. They argued that this was mainly a result of the crisis of the political, the failure of the state and political parties to manage the contradictions of the ruling class and carry out a transition towards capitalist democracy. This crisis had many dimensions and causes. Firstly, there was an abandonment of state development planning to enact a transition towards capitalist democracy, orchestration of pressures from both internal and external reaction created a situation in which the Nehruvian plan for a reformist capitalism with its policies of public sector, state control over resources planning, a relatively anti-imperialist foreign policy were all renegotiated. Indira Gandhi's government initially gave in to some of these pressures. It was most, its most celebrated collapse being the acceptance of devaluation of the rupee. There was a gradual decline of emphasis on planning and the policy of large public investments. The subsequent regimes after Indira Gandhi also gradually abandoned the element of historical thinking of agrarian transformation as a matter of dispensable luxury and went for what it rationalized to itself as more 
pragmatic program. It reduced even the planning apparatus entrusted by Nehru with the task of such serious long term developmental reflection to more short term accounts though depending on its statistical ability to turn the poverty of people into the wealth of the nation. Gradually the government allowed a massive campaign to gain momentum for privatization of industry and other economic activities reducing public investment altering the nature of investment where it still existed. Secondly, there was a persistent crisis in center state relations resulting in a climate of political instability. Under Indira Gandhi, the regional center situation changed drastically. Increasing pressure were mounted now for regional allocation of heavy industries and other such symbols of regional prestige. The regionalism that threatened to engulf the polity was quite clearly a consequence of the inequities of the capitalist growth process. Governments have been consistently inattentive to regional economic inequality inherited from the colonial period. Capitalist development intensified these imbalances even further. Nowhere is this revealed more than in the internal in incompatibility between regional demands according to Kaviraj. Regionalism in Punjab is essentially an anti redistributive agitation which insists on retaining and extending the economic advantage of the state particularly of the farmers over other states, regions and classes. The Assam agitation presses what are in essence redistributive demands on the central government and the two kinds of demands are uncomposable. The center also played up regional demands with an incredible short sightedness. Thirdly, there was an excessive favoring of industrial bourgeois rather than slowly building up capitalist economy. An elaborate scheme of industrial and import licenses were allowed to be turned to the advantage of the industrial and commercial having better connections and better access have got away with the lion's share in the bureaucratic allocation of the lines, thus preempting capacity creation and sheltering oligopolistic profit. This helped create what would be remembered as the dreaded license raj system contributing to a further crisis in governability. Fourthly, there was an embrace of populism and plebiscitary democracy that resort to the battle of ideologies and coherent socio-political programs. The Congress government under Indira Gandhi gradually allowed a profitable breakdown of bourgeoisie framework of formal propriety since there were occasionally inconvenient encumbrance in its path. In bourgeoisie political systems there must be a reliable relation between the structure of class and the format of parties. Abandonment of ideological politics by the ruling party and cheerful retaliatory imitation by the opposition groups causes this relation to break down through defection, bending of constitutional norms, etc. Fifthly, there was an increasing personalization of power and weakening of democratic institution which created a governability crisis. Ceremonial leadership of the Congress party became a redundant function. Either Indira Gandhi herself was the leader, but she derived her legitimacy from being the premier or when it was someone else, his position was purely decorative. This development implied the destruction of one of the checks within the Nehruvian structure. The party could often balance the governmental wing except for the times of election. Indira Gandhi ran what could be ironically called a partyless government, in which symbolically some of a minor office functionaries assume more importance in terms of access, timing, power of facilitating and delaying decisions than senior party members. In this module, we have seen how the idea of ruling class in India is defined. It is defined as a coalition of different classes and different interest groups. The three main groups that form this ruling class are the bourgeoisie, the landed elite, and finally, the bureaucratic managerial class. We have also seen how there are tensions between these coalition groups and that leads to political implications. In the 1980s, 
especially we have seen how the peasant groups moved out and formed regional parties because they believed they were not given enough room within this coalition. Therefore, what we have seen in this module is that the working class and the subaltern groups however, have been used politically, but remain at margins even in the post independence period. Thank you.